series of supplemental lectures dealing with research methods. Today we're going to talk about descriptive univariate statistics. Overall today we're going to be talking about five major topics. Frequency distribution, graphing, distributional shape, measures of central tendency, and measures of variability. Those issues are what we're going to be dealing with over time. But let's look at the definitions first of univariate and bivariate. Since we are talking about univariate statistics today, we'll start out with that. And it just simply means that there's one and only one dependent variable that's involved in this study. One and only one dependent variable. You can remember from last time, the dependent variable is the one that the researcher is interested in studying. Bivariate statistics deal with more than one variable involved in the study, more than one dependent variable. So when a statistician is looking at two issues, maybe he wants to find cause. Uh, does one thing cause another? Uh, he might be dealing with bivariate statistics. When they want to see relationships between two things, he be dealing with correlations. But we'll be dealing with that more in uh, lectures that will be coming up. Again, we're going to deal with five things, and the first one is going to be frequency distribution. So let's look first at the frequency distribution. Frequency distributions show how many subjects were similar in the sense that measured on the dependent variable that's being studied, they ended up in the same category. Let me say that again. It shows how many subjects were similar in the sense that measured on the dependent variable, these subjects ended up in the same category. Now, there are three types of frequency distributions that we can think about. First is simple or ungrouped. Now, when we have an ungrouped frequency distribution, we just simply take all of the scores, all of the possible scores that, that could have been had on, on any given instrument, let's say, and we list them all, and we list the number of people that made that score. No apparent grouping whatsoever. In grouped score, what we do is we create ranges of scores. So let's say 95 to 100, 90 to 94, 85 to 89, and so on. And then we put the number of people that fall within each group or category. And finally, we could have cumulative scales. And this is really a special case of the group frequency distribution in which a column is added to show the cumulative effects of a frequency distribution. In other words, how many students maybe ended up within any given range of scores and all others lower scores or lower score intervals. So it's this column of percentages. So you might see the low score 0 to 10 as having 1%. And then let's say 11 through 20 having had another 3%, but the cumulative would be 4%. Because you had 1 before, and now you've had 3, so now you have 4, and so on. You keep building, you keep adding on till you get to the last score where you get 100%. Sometimes that helps us to understand how numbers actually impact the overall score. So just quickly to summarize, we have three types of frequency distributions. Similar, or simple, pardon me, simple or ungrouped, grouped, and cumulative. Now frequency distributions don't tell you very much if they're placed in a table. But they begin to tell you a lot when you put them in graphs. And so we're going to look at graphs. And we're going to look at four different types of graphs in, in this discussion. The first is histograms, then bar graphs then what we could call the frequency polygon, and finally, the pi graph. So let's start with histograms. Histograms are used to indicate how many times a given score appears in any given data set. When we look at the x-axis of a histogram, it's labeled with the numerical values that represent the quantitative variable. Bar graphs are similar to histograms. But the x-axis represents the category of the quantitative variable. Let me give you an example of what we might need. If we're doing a histogram, the variable we might be looking at might be age, the quantitative variable. Might be age. 
And so we could then map out the number of people responding to age. But we could be looking to see what kinds of problems kids have when they are exposed to a toxin. So maybe they get an itch or a burn or a crawl or a rash or a welt or hives or they get scaly or acne or they, they develop internal ulcers or whatever. We've mapped that on a bar graph, but we've mapped the age on a history. Then we have frequency polygons. Frequency polygons, the frequency polygon is the technical name for a line graph. It can represent data in the form of a histogram, at which point you're going to see the sort of curve forming, or it can re represent data similar to a bar graph where the x-axis represents the category of the dependent variable. It could be diseases. Then we have a pie. The pie graph is actually an easy to understand view of how a universe, or let's call it a full group, is made up of subgroups and the percentage of membership of each sub. Graphs give you a, a visual way of looking at data so that it makes a little bit more sense than looking at data through a chart. Now we're going to deal with the next topic we're going to deal with is the distributional shape, which is a, an indication of symmetry, whether or not data is symmetrical. So there's this thing called the normal distribution. Sometimes you might hear it as the, referred to as the bell curve. In normal distribution, most of the scores are clustered smack dab in the middle, right there in the middle of a continuum of scores reported. And what you then have is a gradual and symmetrical decrease in frequency.